that so the superstitious find no one least branch there left behind. For look, how many leaves there be neglected there. Maids, trust me, so many goblins you shall see. Pseudopod, episode 851 for February the 3rd, 2023. Hosted by Ben McKenzie. Audio by Chelsea Davis. This week, Flash on the Borderlands 64. Purification. Greetings, listener, and welcome to Pseudopod. I'm Ben McKenzie, your host for this week. This is my first time here on Pseudopod. Usually, I'm hosting my Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast, which is called Pratt Chat. If you're familiar with Pratchett's work, you might wonder what I'm doing here. He's known for fantasy and comedy, not horror. But he believed fantasy was a very broad church, encompassing everything from Tolkien to Lovecraft to Agatha Christie, and definitely horror. His second ever published story, Night Dweller, appeared in New Worlds magazine in 1965 when Pratchett was just 17. And that's a very serious horror tale about the terrors experienced by a crew who travel beyond the edge of our solar system. It's pretty good, though Pratchett presumably didn't think so. He never allowed it to be collected or republished, but perhaps that's just because there aren't any jokes in it. Though even his comedy novels do sometimes contain some moments of true terror, especially the ones for children. But anyway, that's enough about Pratchett. He didn't write any of this week's collection of Flash fiction stories, which are all pseudopod originals. That's what Flash on the Borderlands is all about, because Flash fiction, if you're not familiar with the term, refers to very short stories. Loosely defined, it's anything up to about a thousand words. And you can do a lot with less than a thousand words, as you'll see in the brilliant trio of stories we have for you this week. First up is Candlemas, written by Don Mark Baldridge and narrated by Kelly Frank. Writer Don Mark Baldridge is a professor of art and computer science, which sort of tells you what you need to know about him. A US citizen, he's been around the world spending months and years at a time abroad. Don Mark is a founding member of A Loose Unsyndicate. Narrator Kelly M. Frank is a former English professor and currently works as a full-time horror artist and writer with her company Morbid Smile Art. She writes film and book analysis reviews and has appeared in a number of anthologies including Georgia Gothic, Stories from the Dark Side of the Deep South, Slice Girls and Flesh and Bone Rise of the Necromancers. You can find Kelly at indoor and outdoor festivals, conventions and shows of all kinds in the Atlanta area or online at morbidsmile.com. And now we have a story for you. And we promise you, it's true. Candlemas by Don Mark Baldridge In silent, black and white, hand cranked, 16 frames per second, a large piece of driftwood washes up on this cold and miserable island. The devout recognize something in it, believe they can trace in its gnarled whirls the figure of the Virgin. These simple people build a small chapel of rough fieldstone and enshrine it there, an upright, kneeling shape. A hundred years later, the chapel has fallen into ruin. Crossfade to expired Fuji 16 millimeter color stock, pushed slightly, grainy and hand held. The former fishing village all but abandoned, the sun closing in on the sea. Two girls, foreign backpackers, long legged in bright shorts, orange, yellow, hike across the island. They barely share a language, communicating instead by helpful gestures. A man in a low cap, driving an unmarked lorry, breaks for them, offering a ride. They climb eagerly into the cab, but he attempts to take them beyond their turning, up into the hills, the coming darkness. He won't stop to let them out, hardly looks at them, but accelerates up the incline. At last they throw themselves from the moving vehicle, rolling in the gravel beside the road. 
The truck teeters on the soft shoulder, but doesn't even slow. The driver will not return. They've lost a backpack. Swearing after him, spitting blood and dust, they help one another up. They limp on. They go a long way, dirt embedded in the cuts on their knees, the palms of their hands, before they come upon the deserted village, its only inhabitants furtive and strange, vanishing around corners as the girls call out to them. A mist rises from the sea, enshrouding the old stone buildings, softening the cobbles, the street corners, dimming the few lamps. They encounter an old woman in the street, beg her for help. An inn, they say. A stable, they try miming. Food, rest. But she warns them away. It's Candlemas, she tells them, as if that explains something. A badly repaired film break, ghosts of perforated splice tape, and she too vanishes. The sound of her stick recedes, tapping flagstones. The girls stumble, finally exhausted, across the little shrine, perched just above the village. The view from its tumbled doorway overlooks dirty tile roofs floating on fog. A chill settles over the island. Inside, something like a million candles have burned down over the driftwood figure in a century. They've been left to gutter on every flat surface, jammed into every angle, and their wax has dripped, flowed over the thing, till it looks revolting. Fat, a dead white slug, ropey waxen fangs unevenly overhanging the chin. A single tea light balanced on the thing's knobby head burns, the only light in the place. High contrast, crushed shadows, scratches visible on the film. Together, desperate, trembling, they pull the idol down, break it up with a camping hatchet. They burn it all for heat, light. They share the remaining sleeping bag. Warming at last, they make love beside the flames. The wax-infused shards burn smoky but bright. Exhausted, the girls sleep, thigh between thighs. Meanwhile, the old woman, huddled in her hovel, heats tea in a samovar, its silver blackened by a single tea light. She looks up, listening. Whatever she hears, something distant or very small, it troubles her. She goes to the window, opens it, throwing back the shutters. The cold air moves into her room and settles down like a guest. There in the sky, gray and tattered clouds part, tearing like cobwebs. She crosses herself, staring up at the blackened silver moon. The film freezes, melts in the arc light. A blob of liquefying celluloid bubbles blackly, bursts like a boil. A gash opens in the sky, and blinding white light pours through. Oh, I do love a good found footage story. And while I have seen it done in prose before, usually it presents as discovered documents. Whereas Don Mark manages to keep us in film mode. And he gives it a real sense of immediacy and wrongness without ever needing to be too obvious. Talking about writing this piece, Don Mark said, I've always had a thing for microfiction. Tiny, jewel-like figures acting out their passion play to the chiming of a pocket watch. Repetition seems to polish such tales, not wear them down, till they shine like fairy stories eternally recommencing in some corner of the mind. Oh, even his commentary's good. I think I might need to listen to this week's stories a few times more and see if he's right. Our next story is A Lonely Vigil, written by Bitter Corella and narrated by Halloween Bloodfrost. Bitter Corella is the writer and horror aficionado behind the microfiction comedy Twitter account Midnight Pals, which is a personal favourite of mine, 
and asks, what if all your favourite horror writers gathered around the campfire to tell scary stories? When not writing Twitter jokes, she also dabbles in cartooning and text game design. Her horror text games available on itch.io include Nighthouse, All Visitors Welcome, Toadstools, and Santa Carcosa Nights. Narrator Halloween Bloodfrost is proud to represent the trans and neurodiverse community and has been a narrator for escape artists for nigh on a decade. Jer began at Escape Artists on Podcastle with mini episode 65, Blood Willows, and Ties of Silver, which is episode 187, before finding a happy and dark home here at Pseudopod. Steal yourself for our second story. You will hope it isn't true. A Lonely Vigil Written by Peter Corella Narrated by Halloween Bloodfrost We know so little about the origins of consciousness. Have you heard this theory? Scientists say that deep in our primordial past, when we were still just slimy things with legs crawling on a slimy sea, the mind was not one beautiful uninterrupted monologue, but a cacophony of voices, a gaggle of many minds, each designed to fulfill a specific task. One mind to stand at the helm as the body scavenged for food, another to take control to flee a predator, a third to take over at mating time, each mind separate and independent, but all sharing a single brain and a single body. What would happen when a mind was called to give up the wheel? It would simply blink out of existence, gently falling into oblivion, until the time came that it was called upon to resume control, and then, instantly, it would return. But our ancestors, who had fewer voices vying for attention in their heads, were better able to survive, and in time, all those voices merged. And now, each of us is but a single, unified consciousness. Almost unified. What if I told you that not all the voices merged? What if I told you that there is still one who remains separate? The mind that controls sleep. He remains separate and alone. The night watchman who mans the controls when you slide into oblivion every night. Surely you sense him, sometimes at the changing of the guard, sliding past as you drift into sleep, and he erupts into waking. What a strange, solitary existence he must live. To lie, paralyzed but alert, under the thick blanket of sleep, all he knows is the walls of your bedroom over the years. He has memorized every inch of your bedroom, for he has nothing else to do, nothing else he can do. For the eight plus hours of his nightly patrol, the slightest movement, the merest twitch of a limb, would break the spell, plunging him back to darkness and bringing you to waking. Perhaps today you decide 
to go on vacation, a weekend jaunt to some seaside hotel. Tonight, he will wake up in a strange bed in an alien room. And what can he make of this? He knows nothing of your daily preambulations. He is separate from you. Perhaps he might piece together a fragmented picture of your life from the occasional stray memory that somehow drifts across the infinite gulf that divides you from him. This would be his only clue. A random, fleeting thought from the mind of a stranger. Yet, even so, he weaves together these foreign memories, the only thing he can do in the stillness of his head, into something and then lops it back across the gulf toward you. Through your dreams, he calls out to you. Hello. Are you awake? As I said, I love the Midnight Pals, which is a brilliant use of microfiction in itself, but to my shame, I hadn't made the effort to check out Bitter Corella's other work. Well, this it changes all that. In less than 500 words, she's inserted an idea into my head that I'll carry with me forever. And I bet you will too. Isn't it just a little too plausible? Won't you be wondering about this when you next go to sleep? I know I will. Anyway, do yourself a favor and check out her other work Go to her itch.io store, not least because at the time this episode's coming out, she's got a big fundraising sale on for a friend in need. And it's not just games there, you can also get ebooks, including the old Snatch and Grabber's big book of child eating monsters, which I, I found quite delightful. Um, and then also there, there are collections of the Midnight Pals. So you don't even need to go near Twitter to read about them. Our final story this week is The Lighthouse Used to Have Keepers, written by Rachel Unger and narrated by Lisa Wood. Rachel thinks that now is an excellent time for us all to be kind to each other. Yes, really. She spends her days excavating stories from the dirt, staring down a microscope, and daydreaming about her next bike ride. You can find her online at www.fictionbuffet.com. Narrator Lisa Marie Wood is a multi-award winning dark fiction author, screenwriter and poet. She won the Golden Stake Award for her novel The Promise Keeper and has published short fiction in groundbreaking works including Sycorax's Daughters and Slay, Stories of the Vampire Noir. And her poetry was featured in the Bookfest Book Award winning anthology Under Her Skin. Wood is also the founder of the Speculative Fiction Academy, an English and creative writing professor and a horror scholar. You can find more about her at www.elmariewood.com. Now, take a deep breath, relax, and let yourself fall into our final story. The truth is within you. The Lighthouse Used to Have Keepers by Rachel Unger Read by Lisa Wood Welcome to tonight's meditation and the final meditation of your island retreat. Let's begin with a wind-down exercise. Take a moment to settle yourself comfortably in your chair, feet on the ground, facing out toward the water. Take a deep breath, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. Feel the pull of air down your throat, expanding the soft flesh of your belly. Good. Notice how the brilliant blues of the summer afternoon have faded into the bruised 
sallow tones of sunset. Fog gathers at the horizon, about to roll over the beach for the night like a thick blanket. Far below the open lighthouse window, the water washes between the weathered limbs of the trees, their shadows stretching long over the sand. Let's take a moment and breathe as the setting sun tints the fog with crimson and darkens the tree's pale, reaching fingers. Be aware of the room around you, filled with artifacts of previous lighthouse keepers. Sink into a deeper meditative state as you notice the staring eyes of their portraits, the gaze of dead men drawn here via pen and ink through paper like a seance. You've read the battered logbook of their duties, operating the foghorn, maintaining the light. The old tome sits quiet now on the mantel below the oldest portrait. Beside it is a wooden carving. The whittled lines of the ship echo the grain of the driftwood, turning and twisting. The boat is tilted as though about to capsize, only held up by the picture frame. The portrait's physical border has been carved from another piece of pale driftwood. They call these barrier islands a refuge, the wildlife protected from most human presence. This place doesn't see many people anymore. Only the occasional retreat members like yourself and the employees at the education center just off the causeway. The lighthouse used to have keepers, those men portrayed on the walls around you, charged with ensuring the safety of the boats. For over a century, the Sui Native Americans fished and hunted amongst the juniper and myrtle protected creeks, smallpox, slavery, and the sea reduced their numbers. The only trace of them here, now, are the oyster middens. Before them, before the lighthouse, the coastline had other visitors. Pirates and smugglers, trade passing north and south. There were more wrecks then. Men pulled from their ships into the waiting water. There are so few visitors to the island these days. You have entered into a state of total relaxation. As the light fades, the fog envelops the island below and the machinery of the lantern begins, the programmed cycle like a daily ritual. You are filled with gratitude for your own beating heart, rhythmically sweeping blood through you like the lantern sweeps light across the water. Your body rises, feet making their careful way down the spiral stairs to the outer door. This does not alarm you, as you have done it so many times before during this retreat. These stairs are as familiar to you as your own body, the slow grind of the machinery like your pulse. The icy handle of the yellow lighthouse door turns under your hand, rust biting into the skin of your palm. The cold grit of the sand rasps underfoot when you step away from the lighthouse toward the water's edge. Behind you, the tangle of tidal creeks spidering over the island all rush from the cover of palmetto and myrtle to the ocean, like a throng of onlookers for your stroll. The soft sound of salt water grows slightly louder as you approach the evening air is cool, the humidity from earlier in the day being sucked into the low gray clouds surrounding you. The stark silhouettes of the trees emerge from the mist. They call beaches like this boneyard beaches for the driftwood remains of shoreline forests. The bleached white trees have been etched by water, wind, and the abrasive kiss of time. The distorted pattern of the bark is uneasy and combative, like the contortions of a language struggling to be born. In the distance, the foghorn moans, causing your bones to vibrate. Feel the motion of them in your body, calling out to the water like a summons or an offering. Shells of oyster and whelk reach for the skin of your feet like teeth. 
You pass beyond the trees, leaving their thrumming tension behind. The rhythmic splashing of the waves draws you onward. As you walk, the water retreats as though caught in the ebb of an exceptionally low tide. You continue on for minutes and then hours. After a while, the foghorn is only a whisper behind you. The light from the lantern room fades until there is only the darkness above and the crunch of the icy sand under your bloodied feet. There is something more than the fog out in the water. Though you approach, you never get a good look at the shadowy form. Perhaps you are passing near more driftwood, though perhaps not. Breathe deeply, inhaling the copper-rich tang of the mist underlain by the smell of the ocean. Your tears add more salt to the air, like adding savor to a meal. The coiling form in the fog comes closer, although you still do not understand what you are seeing. Only its voice is familiar. It is the same whispering as the portraits speaking to you in the night, like the wind through the limbs on the boneyard beach. You will not understand, even at the end. But your knowledge is unnecessary for the ritual to conclude. Your sacrifice is accepted. When I'm not making podcasts, I work with kids a lot. And one of my jobs has been to run workshops with teenage boys. That's probably not the kind of horror you've come here for, so I'll spare you the details. But as part of those workshops, I taught ways to deal with stress. I've run creative visualization sessions just like this hundreds of times. Well, okay, not just like this. This one really sucked me in. Because I've seen the form parodied for laughs plenty of times. It's a great comedy podcast, uh, the Shusha Meditation Podcast, which does exactly that. But to turn it into a horror story? That's genius. And I love that Rachel kept so many of the things that make a guided meditation work. It's a journey that takes you away to a peaceful location with multi-sensory descriptions that help your brain distance itself from what's worrying you. In this case, by giving you something new to worry about. But that's it. We've come to the end of this flash on the borderlands. And what a delight it has been. How great are these stories? I feel so lucky that this is the trio that I got. I loved all of them. But of course, we want to know what you think. Let us know via social media or if you're a Patreon subscriber, jump on the Discord and let the Pseudopod team know there. And while I'm talking about subscribing and support, as you probably know, Pseudopod is funded by people like you, listener. One of the reasons I was so keen to come on as a guest host is that, like the folks at Escape Artist, I think creative workers deserve to be paid. And at Pseudopod, they pay everyone, writers, narrators, producers, something they're rightly very proud of. But just like the podcasts I've worked on, Pseudopod relies on your generosity. If you enjoy listening to the show, and if you're able, please go to pseudopod.org and donate by clicking on Feed the Pod. Or if you're like me and you love a good nerdy t-shirt, check out the Escape Artist store at Void Merch. They've got hoodies, tank tops, sweatshirts, and other stuff. And I don't know if you've seen the Pseudopod text logo ones, but they are metal as. And the link for that is on the main Escape Artist page. You can also find it on the pinned post on their Twitter and a few other places. And of course, there's other things you can do to support the podcasts and creators you love, even without spending any money. Pseudopod please consider leaving reviews of this and any of your other favorite episodes on wherever you listen to your podcasts, share them on whichever form of social media seems the least awful this week, or just tell your friends. Believe it or not, word of mouth is still one of the major ways people find new podcasts. Pseudopod is part of the Escape Artists Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit And this episode is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Download and listen to the episode on any device you like, but don't change it or sell it. Theme music is by permission of Anders Manga. 
I'll leave you with a closing quote from, well, who else would I choose? Terry Pratchett. It is well known that things from undesirable universes are always seeking an entrance into this one, which is the psychic equivalent of handy for the buses and closer to the shops. Thanks for having me on. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. Take care. Stay safe. Until the next episode. An arm appeared from nowhere on the shape, seemingly projected like the pseudopod of a protozoan. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.